evidence is very important, it's extremely important. It's definitely something that should be part of the conversation, but it's not the only thing that matters. Um, you know, in my experience, the most effective proposals often include um, good data paired with a good story. On episode seven of the Prevention Matters podcast, I talked with Sarah Dubay from the Pew Charitable Trust. Sarah is the director of the Results First Initiative, working to advance evidence-based decision-making by states and counties to help government leaders direct investments into programs and policies that generate the best outcomes. Sarah talks about her background and experience in public policy, what most people get wrong when dealing with policymakers, and the nickname her friends call her. All of that coming up on this episode of the Prevention Matters Podcast. The National Prevention Science Coalition is the premier professional association dedicated to translating scientific knowledge into effective and sustainable programs and policies to enhance the well-being of children, families, and communities. To find out more about the National Prevention Science Coalition or to become a member, please visit www.npscoalition.org. And now the host of the Prevention Matters podcast. Dr. Robert Lachos. Sarah Dubay is the director of the Results First Initiative at the Pew Charitable Trusts. She manages the initiative's work to advance evidence-based decision-making by states and counties, including the use of innovative cost-benefit analysis tool that helps government leaders direct investments into programs and policies that generate the best outcomes. She graduated from Tufts University with a bachelor's degree in history and earned a master's in public policy from the Goldman School of Public Policy at the University of California, Berkeley. Sarah, welcome to the Prevention Matters podcast. Thanks so much for having me, Robert. So my first question is is just about your um, background and experience in public policy. How does somebody come from a background in history and now is leading an initiative to influence public policy? It's a great question that my uh, family asks me often. Um, so I've spent the better part of the past 20 years working in both policy and what I like to consider related fields. Um, so I've worked at Pew for 12 years now, um, and I started out in a cross-cutting role, um, which essentially meant that I worked on several different projects focused on state government performance like election administration, public safety, um, and child welfare. And then shortly after arriving at Pew, I moved to Results First, uh, where I helped launch the project. Um, before Pew, hopefully I can connect some dots here, um, I worked at a small consulting firm in California that did evaluation and strategic planning work for foundations and nonprofits. Um, and that ranged from large foundations like Gates and Hewlett and Packard uh, to smaller California-based nonprofits. Um, and that did include some clients that worked on a uh, policy change. Um, and then prior to that, um, I attended the Goldman School, as you mentioned, to get my MPP, um, which really did open my eyes to uh, many of the tools and strategies that we employ um, with Results First today um, to effectively influence policy change. I'd always been interested in public policy, even in my, my history days, um, but um, in undergrad and then in the early years of my career, um, I really focused more on direct service, uh, more as an AmeriCorps member and then coordinating a volunteer program. So it was really kind of hard to see that big picture. There's a lot of work on the individual level, which is, of course, important. Um, but policy school was really that bridge for me to, um, to seeing the bigger picture and working on wider policy change. And so... Um, what did you learn at Berkeley that really helps you do your job now? So Berkeley's program is um, designed really well in the sense that the first year is focused on core skills. So even folks like me who had a history background and didn't do much work in economics or statistics were able to get up to speed um, with those skills. So a lot of very quantitative skills. Um, classroom learning in that first year, again, focused on economics, statistics, um, different elements of policy analysis. And then the second year is really applied. So I did a lot of work in um, program evaluation and doing uh, policy projects um, for clients. So really being able to 
um, have those quantitative skills. I like to say that I'm, I know enough to be dangerous. You know, I'm, I'm not the person who runs the cost benefit model, but I certainly know how to interpret the results and present those to policymakers. Um, those are all things that, that I certainly um, learned and were reinforced at Berkeley. So what is the results first initiative? How did that get started and what is the purpose of it? Sure. So Results First um, is an initiative of the Pure Charitable Trust, as you know, um, and was previously a partnership with the MacArthur Foundation. Um, they supported us for the majority of the project term um, to date, so 2010 to 2019. And it's really helped state leaders um, identify and invest in what works. So that means a few things. That means um, helping policymakers, um, both leaders and staff, uh, understand evidence, um, why it's important to decision making, uh, where they can find it, um, because many folks don't don't know where to go, even if they do understand that it's important. And then um, most of all, using all of the best available data and, and research to inform funding decisions. Um, since we launched Results First back in 2010, we've worked with 27 states and 10 counties around the country, helping them shift more than a billion dollars evidence-based programs. And, and that includes a few things. That's moving funds away from ineffective programs um, towards effective ones, again, demonstrated by research, um, and then also investing additional resources in those most effective programs. So a wide range of way that, ways that states have really prioritized um, the use of evidence in the decision-making process. Um, and I'd say that you know doing this has, has really helped state policymakers um, do a couple of things. Make, make the most efficient use of limited state funds. So be good stewards, good fiscal stewards of, of their um, state funds. And then also generating um, positive outcomes for residents uh, participating in the programs that, um, that are affected by their funding decisions. Um, so it really does give state leaders um, an evidence-based approach instead of tools that can lead to, to better informed budget and policy decisions. And we've seen many examples of that um, around the country with those 27 states and 10 counties. So what were some um, barriers or frustrations in working with these organizations and stakeholders and getting them to use evidence-based um, data or information to make programmatic or policy decisions? So um, I think, People, and I would include myself in this before I started working um, directly with policymakers, um, kind of oversimplify um, what it means to work in policy, but it's it's often a lot more complicated than that. Um, and there are there are a few things that um, I've found can kind of um, correct some of those those missteps and and uh, be more effective. Um, one of the things that I see time and again is um, folks who um, present policymakers with solutions. Um, that are either based on what other states are doing or even based on the latest research, instead of actually starting by asking them a problem they want to solve. Um, so starting with, with, with the problem, with uh, understanding what the problems that policymakers want to solve um, is a much better starting point and then working together to identify potential solutions so that they're invested in the work um, and they can actually use those solutions to solve problems. Um, I'd say that it's also... Um, really important to uh, avoid um, not understanding how government works, right? It's important to understand um, how you can actually influence policy change, when you can do it, how it's most likely that you're going to be heard, um, and then whatever data or research that you have can actually influence decision making. So um, a misstep that, again, I've seen time and again is um, not understanding how state government works and how those decisions are made. We know that policymakers use a variety of information in which to base their decisions on. They can use their own personal beliefs. They can use anecdotal information, stories that their constituents have. They can be pressured by outside forces like lobbyists, or they could be using, you know, scientific evidence. Um, where's the tension in that? in terms of, of what you're trying to do in the Results First initiative? So we believe strongly, and I can certainly speak for myself, believe strongly that uh, evidence is very important, it's extremely important. It's definitely something that should be part of the conversation, but it's not the only thing that matters. Um, you know, in my experience, the most effective proposals that either we brought forth or staff have brought forth to, to state leaders 
often include um, good data paired with a good story um, of a person or a community that's been affected by whatever change is being proposed or, or will be affected by that change. Um, because again, evidence is, is critically important and I certainly believe it should have a seat at the table, um, but there are real people behind those numbers. Um, and that's what policymakers honestly care most about. So I think the way to address the tension is to include both data and evidence and, um, and storytelling um, in the influencing process. So the Results First initiative has been going on since 2010. Um, what are some specific tools that you provided states or counties that they can use to use evidence to make programmatic or policy decisions? So one of the, um, I'd say, most popular um, tools that we have created is called the Results First Clearinghouse Database. Um, most folks are familiar with research clearinghouses, which present um, the effectiveness um, or lack thereof of a variety of programs um, based on uh, multiple research studies in a given policy area. So what works um, clearinghouse for education, for example, um, is a federally run clearinghouse that um, that rates the effectiveness of a variety of different education programs. Um, so policymakers can can look to that um, when deciding what programs to fund. Um, what the clearing what our clearinghouse does is um, it essentially is a clearinghouse of clearinghouses. So it allows policymakers to go to one place to find information on the effectiveness of a variety of social policy programs. Um, it's a publicly available resource on our website. Um, it's searchable by policy area, by clearinghouse, um, by effectiveness rating. Um, so that's something that we've developed that's really helped policymakers and staff um, understand the effectiveness of the programs they offer and then how to improve them. Is there an example where there was a county or, or a state that was faced with a situation where you can say, you know, what we're doing with the results first initiative is really for facilitating outcomes for their population and their constituents. The clearinghouse has, has helped um, both states and county um, leaders do a variety of things in terms of understanding their programs better and then aiding in that um, decision making about programs. You know, they've done things ranging from being able to identify those effective programs and, and prioritize the use of funds on those programs. Um, a great example that um, that we've seen and actually put out a brief a couple of years ago um, is from the Iowa Department of Corrections. Um, they used um, something called the program inventory process, which we worked with them to execute, which is essentially just taking stock of all the programs offered. Um, and then they matched that list um, to programs in the clearinghouse database to understand um, what works um, to effectively reduce recidivism, which is one of the departmental goals. Um, and then they took that information to shift resources to effective programs that support those goals. So again, worked with them to understand the programs that they were offering. They did not have a full sense of the scope of programs that were currently being offered. And then they used the results for clearinghouse database, again, with our help to determine the effectiveness of each of those programs. Um, and that allowed them um, to um, have the information they needed to make funding decisions. Yeah, and that that's very interesting to me. So you, you have an organization, um, the Iowa Department of Corrections, correct? Yes. And so they have a, a goal or uh, an objective to reduce recidivism. Mm -hmm. So they've identified the problem already. Right. And so it was, is it your understanding that they kind of said, we we want to figure out like the best way to use our, our limited resources and to have the best outcomes or was there some outside pressure or did even your organization kind of nudge them in that direction? No, the, the first statement is, is certainly correct. Um, the department had identified a goal to reduce recidivism as a department-wide goal. It really permeated um, the work that they did, but they didn't actually know if they were doing that. Um, so one of the ways to better to help them better understand if they were actually uh, making progress toward reducing recidivism was to understand if the programs they were offering were actually doing it. Um, so no, that was absolutely a goal that they identified, and then we provided them with the tools and the technical assistance to to help um, identify progress made toward that goal. Yeah, but I, I would think that um, in order to get an organization or stakeholders 
or influencers to that position, they would already have to be, you know, what I call a learning organization, right? They mm -hmm. would have to already kind of say, okay, there, there's an issue going on with recidivism and we kind of need to do kind of overarching view of our, our programs and not necessarily evaluate our current programs, but just ask the questions, is this best practice? And is that something that really the results first initiative and the clearinghouse can provide? Well, I'd say that that first, the folks that have approached us um, within those states and counties um, have this mentality already. So um, while they don't, and might not understand, you know, the details of evidence-based policymaking or truly what levels of evidence are, um, they know that they want to focus on what works. Um, that is, I think, something that the vast majority of people we've worked with, and certainly everybody who we've worked with in any successful manner, has come to the table with. Um, so that is an orientation um, that that people we've worked with already have. And I, I'd say that we provide them with the tools um, to to help them build on that. So that's kind of the, in, in, in my work, because I do a lot of program evaluation and prevention science work, I would say that's the low hanging fruit, right? right. You, you've got people that are interested, they're learning communities, they're probably already doing some type of program assessment or evaluation. I think the the harder reach is to get those policymakers and, and staff that have just been doing the same thing over and over and over again and have never asked the question, is this the right thing to do? Is there any evidence? And do we care if there's any evidence to support what we're doing? Absolutely. Um, and I think that to address that, we have, we results first have put out a variety of different tools. The Clearinghouse Database is, is one example. Another is the Evidence-Based Policymaking Resource Center, which is a collection of all of the research that we at Results First have conducted, along with dozens of examples of how states and counties have implemented um, effective strategies. And um, that is really a way to uh, reach a, a a wide range of uh, policymakers and staff who aren't necessarily um, that low hanging fruit who um, might think, you know, I need to solve this problem. I don't really care how I do it. You know, the evidence is not top of mind. Um, but what are some of the ways um, that um, that other states or counties may have approached this topic? And um, we've seen thousands of people visit our, our resource center um, and been able to look for um, different strategies that, um, again, look at evidence, but aren't necessarily targeting people who are looking for evidence. Yeah, and I think, it, you know, for a lot of the public programs that we do, uh, there's, a, you know, you, you probably understand that a, a lot of what happens, particularly in public health, we know doesn't work, right? So if you take right. the example of like, drug prevention, you know, the D.A.R.E. program's been going on for 35, 40 years, and there's been everything from one group trials to randomized control trials to meta-analysis saying mm -hmm. that the D.A.R.E. program doesn't decrease um, the likelihood kids would use drugs, but it continues to, to be used in, in different iterations. And because it's so popular and it's always been around, you've got um, policymakers, you know, still supporting it, right? Mm -hmm. So I think the most interesting thing is how do you influence those people, those types of people, right? Yeah. And again, you know, that's, it's certainly something that, that all of us, you know, care about um, and, and want to affect as many people as possible, which is why we have, um, again, developed a, a wide range of resources that aren't necessarily always or only targeted at, at the, at the kind of exemplars, if you will. I would say that, you know, another thing that we've seen over, over the years in our work with states is that states really care about learning from each other. I mean, more so than even, you know, than us, they want to know what their neighbors are doing, what other states in their regions are doing. Um, so we formed a peer learning community. Um, that's, I would, it's not, Definitely a tool, but it's not a resource that Results First has developed um, to present formal opportunities for um, for states to to talk and to learn from each other. We've done webinars, we've done 
both in-person and virtual events. We put on newsletters and, and a variety of different um, opportunities for them to connect with one another. Um, and that's been um, a great way for kind of the states that are leading the charge in this area and the low hanging fruit, fruit as you described to um, to talk with and, and hopefully reach um, states that are uh, less, um, not, not quite at the, at the head of the class. Do you think that, um, I mean, obviously with the results first initiative, it's kind of the, the carrot, right? You're, you're easily providing information to people. You're supporting that, the use of all of those tools. Is there anything that the trust is doing in terms of the stick, like identifying those counties or, or states that are not using evidence-based information? I wouldn't call it a stick so much, um, but we did do a 50 state study a few years back in, in early 2017 um, that looked at how states are engaging in evidence-based policymaking and sorted them into four categories. Um, so you have the states that are, that are leading, the states that show promise, and then the states that have a ways to go. Um, so I wouldn't, again, I wouldn't say that, that was an official um, you know, punitive um, method, but um, but it did showcase how some states are leading the charge and how some are farther behind. And I would say too that that at least anecdotally, I know from um, from from states that were a little behind behind the charge that um, they were motivated by by getting those examples um, from other states. You know, and I think that it's important too that. In reports like that, and in this peer learning community, um, or in the resource center where we highlight examples of effective use of evidence, that when we hold up states um, using those effective strategies, it really does help other states, um, and then hopefully target policymakers um, to learn for future uh, future use. So, was it the intention of the initiative to have that kind of peer influence model? Yes. Yeah, it was always the intention to um, to identify uh, leading states and and help them serve as ambassadors, um, if you will, of evidence based policymaking and how it can be um, successfully applied in a decision making setting, um, and then serving as examples for other interested states. So you've talked about the um, results first initiative, and I'd like to take a more broader kind of um look at things in in your opinion in your your experience how should researchers like me best present evidence to influence prevention and health policy sure um well really whether it's prevention or or health or criminal justice or or really a range of social policy areas um i i'd say there are kind of a few strategies that that rise to the top for me on um, helping to ensure that research and evidence uh, really does influence the decision making process. So I, I think first, um, you know, it's it's critically important to understand policymakers' questions, um, as I mentioned uh, a bit earlier, and the problems that they're trying to solve, rather than just um, researchers or um, other folks trying to influence policymaking, answering the questions that you think policymakers should have. Right. So starting starting at, at what those questions are and helping to answer them instead of just being, instead of just presenting policymakers with answers. Um, another one is to communicate early and often. Um, results first is, um, is an intensive um, uh, model and approach where we have worked very closely with states over many years. This is a, it's a long game. It's a marathon, not a sprint. So been very important um, for us and, and many of our partners we've worked with to, to share progress and uh, quick wins along the way um, to policymakers instead of waiting for kind of the big reveal at the end of a long research product project. Um, and then I think I'd also say that um, it's important for, for researchers and again, others trying to influence policymakers to connect the results from whatever you're studying to policymakers goals and the issues of most interest. Um, even the most compelling findings uh, from the most innovative research um, aren't going to have much traction unless they resonate with decision makers and what they're trying to do um, at the moment. So based on those kind of ideas, what do you think the state of evidence-based policymaking in the U.S. is? 
I think that evidence-based policymaking is in an excellent position right now. We, when results first started back in 2010, there were very few um, states engaging in evidence-based policymaking, especially in a routine way. It was not a part of, uh, it was not a, a key piece of how states made decisions. Over the years, we've seen that there are dozens of states that are not only um, interested in evidence and understand evidence, but are regularly incorporating um, a prioritization of evidence-based programs in their budget guidelines. They're um, passing laws that um, that agencies need to, to present um, proof of a program's um, effectiveness when uh, requesting funding. So we have seen tremendous growth in the state-focused evidence-based policymaking field. And then of course, at the federal level with the Evidence Act that was passed a couple of years ago, um, there has been a lot of momentum at the federal level as well. So I think it's a great time for evidence-based policymaking um, and, and the future is bright. Okay, let's move on to the lightning round. I'm going to ask you some questions and you tell me the first thing that pops into your head. Are you ready? I'm, I'm nervous, but I'm ready. What subject in high school were you not good at? Geometry. What is a better city, Washington, D.C. or the San Francisco Bay Area? Washington, D.C. If you could go back in time, what would you tell your 14-year-old self? The possibilities are really endless. What nickname does your spouse or friends call you? Um... Uh, they, <laughs> my best friend calls me SARS, which is a take on the, um, the, the, the pandemic of our college years. What chore needs to be done at your house right now? The dishes. The sink is always full of dishes, especially plastic cups having two young kids. <laughs> <laughs> well, Sarah, thank you for coming on to the Prevention Matters podcast. It was very interesting learning from you. Thanks so much, Robert. It was a pleasure to talk with you. The Prevention Matters podcast is the official podcast of the National Prevention Science Coalition. To find out more about the National Prevention Science Coalition or to become a member, please visit www.npscoalition.org. If you'd like to hear more episodes, please click on the subscribe button.